scripture reading today will be 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given much, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, let them then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their, li- their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. But deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their, in their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Give me just a second here. I'm going to blame this on Randy. He came up and spoke to me while I was trying to get this all ready and distracted me. And so I wasn't ready. And I just realized right now that I wasn't ready. There we go. Good morning. Good to see everybody today. Uh, grateful for your presence. And we hope that you'll come back and be with us anytime you have opportunity. Uh, we're uh, open to your questions and comments. If you should have any questions about anything that you see or hear, in this assembly, we'd be more than happy to discuss it with you. I um, want to make a mention of a few announcements that uh, uh, I think most of us know already, but, I want, but just in case, you know, sometimes you don't have email or whatever. First of all, our gospel meeting that was supposed to start next Sunday has been canceled. I think most everybody knows, but just in case uh, you didn't check your email or you don't have email, we want you to know that it has been canceled. The reason it was canceled is that Brother David, uh, unfortunately, came down with a very severe case of covid uh, 19 and pneumonia on top of that so he was hospitalized and uh, I, I texted with his wife yesterday and she said David is doing better uh, he was taking his last treatment of remdes- remdesivir which is a, a COVID medication and uh, said he was doing some better but I spoke to David personally when this first came up and David was in very bad shape he could barely talk to me he was coughing very heavily uh, and could barely breathe and so he was in pretty bad shape so continue to remember him uh, in your prayers. I've seen these things where, uh, and I'm sure you have too, where there can be some improvement and then next thing you know it turns south. So let's let, David's not out of the woods yet. Let's continue to pray for Brother David. Susan also has it, but not as severe of a case. But for the, the reason he was sick, we decided to cancel the meeting. That brings up one more announcement. Tonight's sermon was supposed to be a, a sermon pre- preparing us for the meeting, how to have a great gospel meeting or something like that. And so that's out the window. So I've changed the sermon for tonight. Uh, and uh, I, I just want you to know that, that I'm not going to be preaching about the gospel meeting tonight. So those are some announcements that most of us probably know, but I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware. We've been studying the last, last Sunday and today about the qualifications of deacons in a local church. There's a reason for that. The elders have determined uh, that we need some more deacons, and we have put forth, and I'll put those names again at the end of the sermon, we've put forth the names of seven men uh, whom we feel are qualified, uh, but we want your input as well, whether or not you feel that they're qualified. And so uh, we're studying the qualifications of deacons uh, today. That's what will wrap up the lesson. Uh, in about two weeks, if there are no scriptural objections to these men, then we will be appointing uh, those seven men to be deacons. But we're going to finish up the teaching today by looking at 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13 in a little bit more detail. We're going to go through all of those qualifications one at a time uh, so that we understand what those things mean. Now, I will say this, I always say this, or I try to anyway, whenever we're studying the qualifications of elders or deacons, I always try to point out that these qualifications aren't qualifications for supermen. They're just not. Uh, there are qualifications for all Christians, if you stop and think about it. Now, I realize not every Christian has to be married, and I realize that not every Christian has to have children. I understand that. But you set those aside, and these are qualifications that all Christians should have. Now, listen very carefully to what I said. Qualifications that every Christian should have. I didn't say every Christian did have them. Some Christians don't. Some Christians have some work to do. Some Christians have some uh, improvement to make in their lives. So not all Christians have these qualities, but these are not qualities of supermen. These are qualities that all Christians should have. And I think that's very important going forward. We're not looking for supermen. 
We're looking for faithful men. That's what we're looking for, faithful, dedicated Christians to help us in our work. And, and I think that kind of puts the qualifications in perspective for us. So let's dig in here and let's talk about these qualifications. The first one on the list is the word reverent or grave, depending upon your translation. Some translations will say reverent. I think that's what the New King James Version says in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8. Likewise, the deacons must be reverent. I think the Old King James says grave. And some translations say dignified or men of dignity. Uh, and the Greek word that's translated grave or, or dignified here suggests two ideas. Number one is the idea of someone who is very serious. And the other one suggests the idea of someone who is self-respecting. They have some self-respect about themselves. And both ideas are encompassed in the word. And the idea of having self-respect, then that plays right into the idea of being dignified or men of dignity. Now, when we say serious, of course, we're not saying that a deacon can never crack a smile. <laughs> we're not saying that he can never have fun. That's not the point. But the point is that as deacons, they're going to take their work very seriously. And they're going to conduct themselves in a very dignified manner. So once again, you see, that's a quality that all Christians should have. We should all be that way. We should all be dignified. We should all be reverent. We should all be grave. But certainly, that is the case if we're looking for someone who's going to serve in the church as a deacon. They need to be serious, and they need to be dignified, and they need to be self-respecting. The second qualif qualification is the word not double-tongued. The ideal here. Uh, is his character. Does he have an honest character? To be double-tongued is to be a double-talker, to be a liar, to be, sometimes we say, two-faced. He's two-faced. Uh, he says one thing to you and another thing to somebody else, you see. So he's a double-talker, he's two-faced, he's a liar. Uh, sometimes you could even encompass the idea of being indecisive or on the fence when it comes to biblical issues. They just won't take a stand, you see. And what we're seeking here is an honest character. Does this individual that we're considering uh, to be as a, as a deacon, to serve as a deacon in this congregation, does he have an honest character? We've all heard that, or at least we should have, if our parents were doing their job bringing us up. We've all heard that little saying, honesty is the best policy. And I think that's true. Uh, and it's certainly true with Christians. Christians should be honest people. The Bible says, do not lie one to another. And again, that's addressed to all Christians. And the same idea is found here in this qualification. We want somebody with a very honest character. We're entrusting them with certain works in the congregation. And they need to be trustworthy. They don't need to tell the elders, yes, I'll do this, and then not do it, you see. And so they need to be honest and straightforward in their character and in their conduct. The third quality on the list is the idea of not given too much wine. And again, that's in, in verse uh, 8. He says, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given too much wine. Sometimes people like to compare this quality uh, to something that you see up here in verse 3 with regard to the elders. And it says in verse 3, not given to wine. And some people say, act as if there's a distinction there. Not given to wine versus not given to much wine. And they'll say something like this. Well, the elders can't drink at all, but the deacons can drink just a little bit. No, no, no. You've missed all. You've missed the point here. And I think the operative word or the operative phrase is given to. Given to. The, word, the phrase given to means addicted to. We're, not talking, to, we're talking about the man's uh, character. We're talking about his self-control. And to be given to something is to be addicted to something. And I would suggest to you, I have never in my life seen somebody that was given to a little. Have you? Doesn't work that way. If you're given to it, you're given to it a lot. You're given over to it. It's, it's controlling you. And so there isn't, a, a, there isn't any difference at all between verse 3, not given to wine, and verse 8, not given to much wine. They mean exactly the same thing. Not addicted to alcohol. Alcohol is a terrible thing. Uh, it, it is something that no Christian should do. Uh, the Bible tells us that we should be sober, and you can't be sober if you're drinking because alcohol affects the brain, it affects the mind, it affects the judgment. And so we need to be away, take, staying away from alcohol, staying away from intoxicants. And so the, the character of the deacon, once again, is played, comes into play here. Sobriety, this goes to his sobriety, this goes to his character, this goes to the idea, of, once again, of being serious. Sober, you're being serious. Uh, sober, you're being clear-headed and clear-minded. 
uh, we're entrusting these men with, a, with obligations in a local church, and so they need to be serious, and they need to be clear-minded, and they need to be clear-thinking uh, in their character and in their conduct. And so when you're looking at deacons, you need to be looking at uh, people like this. And by the way, as I said, you notice every Christian should have that quality. There shouldn't be a Christian in this room who's given to wine. It shouldn't be a person in this room uh, who is a child of God who's given to wine. That's not a Superman quality. That's something that everybody can and everybody should do if you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Moving on in verse 8, the next quality that we find is not greedy for money. The old King James says filthy lucre. Lucre is just money. And so uh, filthy lucre is dishonest money or dishonest gain. And so some versions will say not greedy for money, uh, and some versions will say not greedy for filthy lucre. I think that's the way the old King James words it. And the idea here is not eager, someone who is not eager for base or sordid or dishonest gain. Someone who is not covetous. And covetousness, uh, particularly here, I think in this context, covetous for material things. Desiring uh, more and more and more of this world's good so much so that you lose focus on the Lord, you see. And so, you're, again, this goes to his character. We're talking about someone who has honesty and someone who has integrity. And if someone becomes greedy for money, uh, you, you stop and think about that, that, that affects their character. It affects the way they do things. And this, this founds, it finds its manifestation in at least three areas. I want you to think about this. Number one, in your personal life. Some, someone who is greedy for money in their personal life will suddenly do anything for money. Several years ago, there was a show on television called New Heart, and there were three characters on there, Larry, Daryl, and Daryl. Remember those? Some of you older folks, some of you younger folks won't remember them. But Larry, Daryl, and hi, I'm Larry, this is my brother Daryl, and this is my other brother Daryl. Well, they had a business, and their business was called Anything for a Buck. Anything for a Buck. Now, that was funny on the New Heart show. That was a funny little bit, but in real life, that's not so funny. When people will do anything for a buck, when they'll lie, when they'll cheat, when they'll beat, when they'll steal, uh, that's not funny. That goes to your character, you see. That goes to your moral character. And once again, you have men that you're entrusting with certain tasks. And I think I mentioned last week that one of the tasks uh, that a deacon could be entrusted with is the treasury of the church. So, so you want to make sure whoever it is that's in charge of the treasury, you want to make sure that person is not greedy for filthy lucre. You want to make sure they're honest. You want to make sure that they have a good character. A second area where this can manifest itself is in your business dealings. You know, we get up and we go to work, and if you have business dealings and you're dishonest and you're greedy for money, things can happen, you see, and, and you can get yourself in over your head. And then, of course, the third area, and where we're concerned about especially here, but the other three tie into it as well because it all goes to your character, but the local church. You want to make sure that you're not greedy for money. In terms of a local church, we have heard over the years... All of us have heard of, of somebody here or there in a local church who was taking funds from the treasury secretly, secreting those funds to himself. That's not good. That's not biblical, you see. And so you can't have somebody serving as a deacon or an elder, for that matter, who is like that. This goes to their character uh, and to their honesty. All, that's what this is all about. It's about character and honesty. And so you're looking for the best kind of people. You, you want to appoint the best men for this job. You don't want to just appoint anybody. You want to appoint the best possible men for this particular job or this particular task. When we move on to verse 9, it says, Holding to the mystery of the faith. Verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Now think about that for a second. The faith is the gospel. You know, we have a system of faith. We're saved by faith. We're justified by faith. We have faith in the Lord. We believe in the Lord. And so the faith is that which we believe. It is the contents of our belief. So the faith stands for the gospel. And holding to the mystery of the faith, the mystery, uh, Mr. Vine, I would love his comments about the word mystery. He, he tells us that the word mystery basically means a hidden truth. But he says in the New Testament it takes on a new significance. In the New Testament it takes on the significance of truth revealed. In other words, what was a mystery at one time is no longer a mystery. The mystery has been revealed. And you see that in Ephesians 3 when Paul said, by revelation, he made known to me the mystery. And so what was a mystery in the Old Testament is a mystery no more. And so he's basically just talking about the gospel here, holding to the gospel, holding to the mystery of the faith, being faithful to the gospel and to everything that it teaches. 
Deacons need to be, bottom line, faithful and stable Christians. Hold your place here in 1 Timothy 3 and turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 4 for just a second. Ephesians chapter 4, and there's an interesting little passage here. The Apostle Paul is talking about growing, uh, growing to maturity and growing in unity. And both of those things are processes in our lives. We, we grow and we develop and we learn and we grow to maturity in the faith. And we grow, uh, because of that, we grow to unity in, with one another in the faith. But in Ephesians 4, uh, verse, we'll start with verse 11 for a little context. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, notice that those were the gifts. It doesn't say he gave gifts to them. It says he gave them. That's what he gave. What did he give? He gave apostles. He gave prophets. He gave evangelists. He gave pastors and teachers. What do they all have in common? Those are all teaching functions, every one of them. And so what did he give them for? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so that was why those teaching functions were given, for the equipping of the saints, that they might do their ministry or their service to the Lord, and that in turn would build up the church, numerically and spiritually. It would strengthen them, you see. And why were they given? Till we all come to the unity of the faith. The context here is unity. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God. By the way, that's a tall order. I'll never achieve the knowledge of the Son of God in this life. But that's the goal, isn't it? That's where God set the bar. We've got to be studying and growing and trying to come to the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, that word perfect doesn't mean flawless, it means complete, mature, full grown. To a full grown man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the goal that has been set before us. Now watch this in verse 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Well, the phrase I wanted to pull out of there was, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Years ago, I heard uh, Brother Roger, Joel's dad, preach on this. And he was talking about the idea. He said, you ever go to a picnic on a windy day? And he said, the wind's blowing. And he says, you're trying to hold down the napkins and the paper plates. And he said, you go over here to pick up the napkin. The wind blew it over here. Next thing you know, a puff of wind carries it over there. And you're walking over here. And, and the idea was tossed to and fro by every wind, you see. And some people are like that spiritually. Every wind of doctrine, every new little thing that comes along, they're not stable. They're not stable. Every new little thing, every little wind of doctrine, every little thing this teacher says, every little thing that teacher says, they follow this and they follow that and they go after this wind, they go after that wind. They're all over the map. There's no stability. And he's saying here, you can't have that. we got to grow up. And especially if someone is going to serve as a deacon in a local congregation, they've got to be men who are grown up. They've got to be men who are mature. They can't be men who are just flopping around after every wind of doctrine. You can't have that in someone who's going to serve as a deacon. So they have to be faithful and stable Christians. Let me throw in another passage while we're on that. Hebrews 10, 25, we know what it says, but let's read it. Hebrews 10, 25, it says, verse 24, for a little context, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. God requires us to assemble together, and to assemble together often and regularly, you see. That that, that is part of a Christian's life. And you can't have someone serving as a deacon who says, that's not important. I don't have to be at the services. Now, we understand sometimes there are work obligations. We got that. That's the world we live in. We understand sometimes people get sick. When you sit there and say, I don't have to be there, that's a problem. That's a problem in any Christian. That is not the way God wants it to be. The word there, by the way, in Hebrews 10.25 is assembling, I-N-G, not assembly, B-L-Y. It's not Sunday morning that he's talking about. He's talking about any gathering of the church. You need to be here. If you're a faithful Christian, you need to be here. And if you're going to serve as a deacon, you need to be here. That's part of what it means to hold to the mystery of the faith. That's not the totality of it by any stretch, but that's a part of it. You can't have someone serving as a deacon who's unstable. You can't have someone serving as a deacon who's all over the map. And you can't have someone serving as a deacon who doesn't think it's important to be here. They need to be here. And so that's very important that we realize this. Well, let's go back to 1 Timothy 3 and let's move into verse 10. And he says, let these first be proved, and then 
let them serve as deacons, being found faithful. The bottom line here is that they have proven themselves. We're looking for people who've already proven themselves. And I have heard this over the years. It's a mistake. But I've heard some churches say, you know, Brother so-and-so over there, he's a really nice guy, but he just doesn't come very often. And if we just appoint him as a deacon, maybe he'd come more often. You're kidding yourself. <laughs> you're, ki you're kidding yourself. His character's already lacking. The character's already not what it needs to be, not what it should be. You need people, you, you don't appoint people to an office, to, to the deacon or to the elder, hoping that they'll improve. They have to be proven first. They've demonstrated by their character. You've been around them a while. You've gotten to know them. And they've demonstrated by their character. They've proven themselves to be faithful. It's the idea. It's not we want. We, it's, if you have any doubt about whether they're faithful, if you wonder about whether they're faithful, that's not the person you want to appoint. It's somebody who's been proven. And he says, let these first be proven, and then let them serve, being found blameless. Now, the word blameless is very important. Blameless does not mean sinless. If it meant sinless, none of us could serve. There could be no preachers. There could be no elders. There could be no deacons. There could be no Christians because we all sin from time to time. We don't necessarily intend to, but the Bible says in 1 John 1 and verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We make mistakes sometimes. We do things we shouldn't do. And, and so it's very important here that we realize that the word blameless does not mean faultless or sinless. If it meant that, it would disqualify everybody. But it does mean that if he's made a blunder, he's fixed it. You can't have somebody continuing to live in sin. You have to have somebody who will acknowledge that he's made a blunder and will ask the Lord's forgiveness and will dust himself off and keep moving on. Once again, that goes to his character. That goes to faithfulness. That's the idea uh, inherent in those words. And it's the same word, by the way, that's used of elders up there in verse 2. A bishop must be blameless. The same idea. You're not going to find any sinless elders, but you will find men who are trying to serve the Lord who do fix their errors when they come up, who do, who do say, I was wrong, Lord, forgive me for this or forgive me for that. That's the kind of person you're looking for. That's a person of character. That's a person of integrity. Well, let's move on. And let's talk about the wives in verse 11. Now, this is a tricky little passage here. It says, Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, Faithful in all things. I say it's tricky for this reason. The word wives, and some of your translations won't say wives. Some of your translations say women. There's a reason for that. The word wife and the word woman comes from exactly the same Greek word. Now, a lot of people don't know that, but it's true. Uh, the word wife and the word woman comes from exactly the same Greek word. And you've heard me say it a million times. The context is always the determiner whether he's talking about wives or whether he's talking about women in general. And so some versions, like my New King James, will say they're wives. And some other versions will say they're women. In this context, uh, you could legitimately translate that either way. I want you to think about that. Now, as we go through that, he says, verse 11, Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, Faithful in all things. Now, one thing that occurs to me as I think about those qualifications, did you know that those were the same qualifications that we just went over on the previous chart? Did you notice that? Let me, let me go over it with you. He says they must be reverent, verse 11. Well, you see the same thing for the deacon in verse 8. He must be reverent. See that? And then you see not slanderers. Well, that's the same thing up there in verse 8, not double-tongued. Someone's a double tongue. It has to do with their control of their mouth, control of their speech habits. And then you see uh, in verse 11, temperate. Well, temperate is the same thing as being not given to wine and not greedy for money. That's somebody who's under control. Temperate is self-control. They're under control. They're not greedy for wine. They're not greedy for money. And so they're under control. And then faithful in all things is the same thing as holding to the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Isn't that interesting? that they have to have the same qualifications uh, as the deacons in the earlier part. And so here comes a question that, that pops up. Is he talking about women in general? Is he talking about the wives of the deacons? Or is he talking about the wives of the deacons and the wives of the elders? And the answer is yes. Think about that. Remember when we started this sermon, 
I said these are qualities that every Christian should have. Look at that for a second. Verse 11. Shouldn't every woman be reverent? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> every Christian woman should be reverent. Shouldn't every Christian woman be not a slanderer? Absolutely. That should be a characteristic of every Christian woman. Shouldn't every Christian woman be temperate? <laughs> you better believe it. And shouldn't every Christian woman be faithful in all things? Of course. Now, if that's true, then how much more should that apply to the wives of those who serve as elders and deacons? Absolutely, it should apply. And so that's why I answered the question, yes. Does it apply to the wives of deacons? Yes. Does it apply to the wives of elders? Yes. Does it apply to all women? Yes, it does. Every Christian woman should be this way, and especially those who would serve, uh, whose husbands would serve as elders or deacons in a church. It would certainly apply to them. So it goes to their character. And, and, and this goes, if you stop and think about it, this goes to the way a man runs his house, doesn't it? The, man, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And so if his wife is faithful, it shows his influence over the family. And so it goes, all, it goes to all of that. And so if you're going to have somebody who's going to serve as a deacon, they have to have qualified wives. Their wives must meet these criteria that we've just looked at here. Reverent, again, the dignified, not slanderers, watching what they say, not talking about people behind their back, temperate meaning self-controlled and faithful in all things, someone who is sticking to the gospel of Christ. The next one, verse 12. It says, Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. Let's take on the first one, the husband of one wife. This is the same thing that you see for the elders up here in verse 2. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. It's no different. Now, there's at least three things involved in that qualification, the husband of one wife. Number one, have to be a male. Sometimes we say you can have female deacons. Well, not according to this, you can't. Must be the husband of one wife. Now, you can't be a husband if you're a female, Never, regardless of what the people tell us today about choosing your gender. You can't choose your gender. If you're female, you can't be a deacon because you can't be a husband. And a deacon has to be the husband of one wife. So number one, a male. Number two, it cannot be a single man. You can't have somebody who's unmarried serve as a deacon. So that's out. It must be a husband. And number three, cannot be a polygamist. You can't have more than one wife. You, you, you can only have one. And that's, again, that's, that's not a Superman qualification. That's something that's true of all Christians. You can't have more than one wife. Let's take your Bibles. Turn with me to Matthew, the 19th chapter. And you, get to see, you begin to see why the husband of one wife qualification is, is very important here. In Matthew, the 19th chapter, in verse 9, Jesus said, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Now you can squall and squeal and gripe and complain about that till the cows come home, but I didn't say it. Jesus did. All I did was read it. And what it basically says is, one man, one woman for life. One exception. That's the teaching of the scriptures. One man, one woman for life, with one exception. And so if you divorce your spouse and you marry somebody else, the civil law might say you're okay, but guess what? God says you're an adulterer. And you can't, you've got two wives. You, can't, you cannot serve as a deacon. You cannot serve as an elder. In fact, you cannot be a faithful Christian. If that is the case with you, that must be understood. Let's take this a little further. Romans chapter 7. In Romans 7, Paul leaves out the exception clause because he's making a larger point about the law. But I want you to notice what he says here in verse 3. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. Why? Because that's exactly what she is. <laughs> she's an adulteress. But she's married. Did you see that? You can marry somebody and still be guilty of adultery if your marriage was not scriptural. And so when he says husband of one wife, he's talking about one scriptural wife, not somebody who's been divorced two or three or four times. That's not, that's not going to work unless that divorce was on scriptural grounds. And so you have three ideas. Number one, a male. 
Number one, someone who's not unmarried, he has to be married. And number three, he can't be a polygamist. One scriptural spouse. That's all you're allowed by the Lord. That's all any Christian is allowed by the Lord. And that certainly would apply to those who serve as elders and deacons. Last one on the list here. Ruling their children and their own house as well. If you look at verse 4, it's exactly the same thing as verse 4. In verse 4, talking about the elders, he says, One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. That's exactly what verse 12 says. Verse 4 and verse 12. Verse 4 for the elders, verse 12 for the deacons. It says exactly the same thing. And it means a couple of things. Number one, you've got to have kids. You can't serve as a deacon or as an elder if you don't have kids. So number one, you've got to have kids. Someone who doesn't have any kids can't serve. They are not qualified. They don't meet the criteria. And number two, your kids must be in subjection. You can't have little heathens running around. You got to have, we were talking about this on the way to services this morning, and, and I, I know I think a lot of our parents do an excellent job, by the way, and I've, I've told some of you that to your face. You do an excellent job with your children. But you know, we all know that there are some parents who just let their kids run wild. And, and, and the kids run the show, and you can't have that. You can't have that as a Christian, and you certainly can't have it if someone who's going to serve as a deacon or as an elder. You can't have, they've got to have their household in control. The home is kind of the proving ground, you see, and this again goes to their character. Does he have his home in control? Now, there is a difference between deacons and elders in this. We think about the word elder. It means older, doesn't it? And so with the elder, you have somebody who's a little bit further down the line. He has age, he has experience, he has wisdom along with that. With a deacon, not necessarily the case. He can be younger. He can, he, can be, he can be further this way down the line, you see. And so therein lies a fundamental difference there. But they, they both have to have children, and their children have to be in submission. So those are the qualities that the Scriptures set forth for a deacon. Now what I'm going to do now is put the names of those men before the church once again so that you'll remember who they are. And by the way, we have forms out in the foyer. If you intend to solicit an objection, we want you to fill out the form. It will guide you. And the names of those men are on the back of that form, so you will remember who they are. The names of the men that we are setting before the congregation as potential deacons. William Birdsong, J. Buck, Colin Churchill, Aaron Kofer, Delvin Defoe, Joe Kamita, and Joel Schaus, those seven men. And I, I want to briefly go over the objection procedure here. And I have it here, and all this will be written on the form. So if you don't remember what I say, it's written on the form out there. But here, I want you to see that. If you're going to object to someone, one of those men, serving as a deacon, you are required to provide your name. We're not going to have anybody taking pot shots from the corner at somebody or taking pot shots from the darkness. You will be required to provide your name. If you do not provide your name, I guarantee you that objection will find its way into the trash can. It's not going to be considered, not even going to be looked at. Okay, so you are required to provide your name. That will help ensure that we act with integrity. Let's remember we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And remember that you, you may have a legitimate objection to somebody. But the person that you're making an objection to is still your brother. The person on the other end of your lance is your brother. Remember that. And remember, too, that when this is all over with, we have to work together. We have to worship together. So let's be very, very careful about this. Your name, the name of the deacon to whom you object. The only basis, by the way, upon which an objection can be tendered is 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. That's why we went over those qualifications. And so you'll be required to provide the name of the person, where he's not met the qualification, and the scripture. For example, brother so-and-so is not the husband of one wife because he's been married before. And you may be required to provide proof of that. You can't just say it. You can't just assert it. You're going to have to back it up with some facts. So understand that. And what we want to do is make sure everybody acts with integrity, that everybody acts above board. Uh, once you've made an objection and you've turned it in, you can take this form uh, and fill it out and give it to any of the elders. And once you've made an objection, you and the elders and that person you're objecting to will be required to sit down and talk about this. Once again, 
sometimes you need clarity. Sometimes you may think something about somebody that's not true. And so we sit down, we have a conversation about it. We're going to discuss this. Uh, and we expect everybody to conduct themselves as Christians when we sit down together. Uh, we're not enemies. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. If you have a legitimate objection, by all means, please bring it forward. It would be wrong for us to appoint an unqualified person. That would be unbiblical. So we don't want to do that. But at the same time, if you do that, do it in a Christ-like manner. Do it in a way consistent with Christianity. The final decision upon whether or not this person is qualified or not will not lie with the objector. It will lie with the elders of the church uh, as overseers. Uh, Obey those who rule over you, Hebrews 13 verse 17 says, and submit yourself. So the final decision will rest with the elders. Last paragraph here says, this is a very serious matter. We should not appoint any unqualified men, nor should we reject any qualified men. Remember that the person to whom you're objecting is your brother in Christ. Even though your objection may be valid, you must treat him with brotherly respect. Failure here could jeopardize brotherly relationships and may have a negative effect upon the unity of the congregation. God will hold each of us accountable for our conduct during this process. And so these objection forms will be out there in the foyer on the table. And, and if you do have an objection, by all means, take one and fill it out. But just remember to conduct yourself as a Christian. Well, we'll wrap the sermon up for this morning. We're grateful that you've come. Uh, if you're visiting with us, I hope you were impressed with one thing and, as we went through this. And that is our desire to be biblical. That's the reason we went through all of this. That's the reason we took the painstaking time of going through those qualities one at a time and, and explaining them all. Because it is our desire here at the Fisher Church of Christ to be biblical in everything we do. To be biblical in our worship. To be biblical in our organization. Uh, to be biblical in our work. We search the scriptures and we try to do exactly what they say. And if that impresses you, we hope that you will also be impressed with the fact that we teach the truth about salvation. In order to be saved, you're going to have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You can't go to heaven and not believe him that. You're going to have to repent of your sins. Don't believe what some of these people out here tell you, that you can just keep on living in sin and go to heaven. It's not true. Uh, you're going to have to repent. Number three, you're going to have to confess your faith in Christ, like the Ethiopian did in Acts 8, verse 37. And then you're going to have to be baptized. A lot of folks out there will tell you, you don't need to do that. But the Bible says otherwise. Jesus himself said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And then coming up out of that watery grave, you need to be faithful, committed to Christ all the days of your life. If that appeals to you, won't you come now while we stand and while we sing?